All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is November 26, 2024, and tonight's teaching is on special request. Maybe not exactly as they had requested it, but it was a request to do a teaching, a short teaching that can be shared, that people can talk about and share with others and understand what we have seen through the revelation of Scripture of this portion called above, something we've talked many times about over the years, and it has never changed. It has only been built upon with greater and greater detail. And so that's what we're going to get into here tonight. If you're new to the ministry, I would recommend uh, you, you're going to want to understand that everything happens in threes. There's a reason for the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke. And you'll realize that in the end of days, it's Luke, Mark, Matthew, right? There's father, son, spirit, or spirit, son, father. There's pre, mid, post. All of these things are true, and they all have their portions. And I'm not going to get into it all today, but what you can do, as I normally share in teachings, is go to the playlist right here and watch the first four videos <coughs> Excuse me, of this intro series right here. And you will understand why... This evening, I'm going to be sharing a lot of things that you'll notice are connected to Luke, to Luke, to Luke. And not only because they're connected to Luke, but because they're only spoken about in Luke. And it may not make sense to you all the way through, but I'm going to show where the scriptures are, what they're saying. But for you to really understand how they connect and why I'm showing from Genesis to Luke, to Isaiah, to Revelation, to some of the epistles. Why am I picking certain texts in there, certain scriptures, to prove my point in these events that will take place in the portion called above, which is a period before the quote-unquote tribulation years begin. It is tribulation. It is the beginning. It does start with the pre-trib. But I'm going to break down what this period of time is. And if you're new, it may not make sense as to why I'm going to these specific scriptures. But if you go to this intro series here, you will understand by watching those first four teachings, you will understand. It's 22 minutes, 30 minute Bible study, 30 minute Bible study, and then a big one, two hours and 45 minutes. That explains why this was all missed. And the answer is because we've all been taught from Matthew. What we've revealed here over the course of over seven years, <coughs> excuse me, is the mystery to the differences in the Gospels and that they relate to prophecy. So when you hear the same story or, for example, you go to the same, you think it's the same discourse, but you don't really understand why the wording is either very different in Luke's and quite different when it comes to to Mark and Matthews. But unbeknownst to you, you've always learnt from the Gospel of Matthew because you never understood who Mark's portion was for and who Luke's portion was for. The Synoptic Gospels, in the end, the first will be last, the last will be first. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end, goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And what you'll realize is everybody's debate and argument over whether pre, mid, or post are true, you will see that they are all true. Luke is pre, Mark is mid, Matthew is post. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they all have places that they will be taken in their portion or that they will get at the end. It is absolutely fantastic. And I recommend going into the first four teachings there. You can also go to ministryrevealed.com. Go to the link that says intro series and start with the same four videos that are there as well. I'm really surprised that the last teaching, as a side note, only has 1,900 views compared to the other ones. If people knew what was in this teaching, they would have skipped many of the other ones to come and listen to this one. That's how powerful it is. He told us in the story of the well and the water bearer. Yes, he did. So I would recommend you go watch that if uh, you haven't watched it yet. All right. So with that, let's get this party started. I am, you know, the request was that I would do the teaching where I would just talk about it, you know, maybe show my face and just have a conversation 
of what it is uh, that's going to take place in the opening, in the portion called above. Well, that's not really how I do things. You know, maybe in live shows, but I want people to understand it. And though new people may not understand why I'm going to those specific scriptures, you will see within those scriptures this same storyline and the details being built on top of each other and on top of each other and confirming and proving each other out all the way through the process. And if you're new and once you go to the intro series, then you'll understand why so much of the focus is in Luke and you'll notice why so many of the parts that are in Luke are not even mentioned in Mark or in Matthew. All right? So with that, let's get started with 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is what we're going to focus on here today. Right here. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Now what happens is right away, people think, well, this is Paul. This is, this is Paul in something that took place and, and it's already happened and he was talking about his journey. That is all true. But remember, everything happens in threes. Was, is, and is to come. Okay, we know that's true from from uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, I think one nine, was is and is to come. What was shall be. What is shall be. Which means there's details in the Old Testament, details in the New Testament that give us prophetic insight into the is to come. And you're going to see something that throws a lot of people off right here because it says 14 years ago, and we're talking about this portion above. Well, when you understand and you go to that intro series, you will see in the third teaching that's 30 minutes, you will begin to understand that the end of days isn't seven years, but 14 years and this period of time called above that we're going to talk about tonight. And the reason it wasn't understood is because everybody learned from Matthew. Once you understand Luke and then Mark and then Matthew, this all opens up to you. So this above portion, it took us a long time. <clears throat> In the early days, I didn't know what it was. I knew it had to be less than 15 years, but of course, uh, um, you know, what that amount was, it, it had to be less than a year. Otherwise, it would have said above 14 years or 15 years. So it took a while to figure out, but once we figured it out, everything else that lined up around it, things that we were looking at, the prophetic typologies, and everything that we were led to over the years that followed continued to prove out this period of time that this is indeed a period of 50 days. <clears throat> and this 50 days is a period that will begin with the pre-trib. Okay? It is the pre-trib and, an, and, and a variety of events that will take place. And that's what we're going to cover here. So let's get into it. I'm going to go right to the very beginning, right right just before it starts to show you what how it will actually start because there's something that happens right before the pre-trib actually takes place and the thing is i'm sharing it but it's not going to be known by everybody and that is right now we are in the laodicean age we've got a teaching within all of this revelation that shows the seven churches in their typology in the old testament and how they've played out since the New Testament, and what happens at the very end of the Laodicean age before the 50 days, the above portion, and the 14 years play out that will restart, <coughs> excuse me, all of the seven churches over again. But what you have to understand is there's a very interesting piece at the tail end of Laodicea that is speaking to a group that we call the remnant bride, a, a portion from among the pre-trib, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, like it told us in 2 Corinthians. It is those, see, I knew a man in Christ. So it is those who are in Christ, and as Romans tell us, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled. That is who the pre-trib is. And there's a group from among them that the Lord is training and preparing and that group is going to be told in advance. I don't know if it's days. I don't know if it's hours. I don't know if it's minutes or seconds. But we know they're going to be told in advance. And you're going to see this right here. And this is what's going to take place to a group of people on the earth right before 
the pre-trib happens. This is the tail end of the modern age Laodicea that we're in right now. <clears throat> it says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and he will and, and will sup with him and he with me. This is very specific. And we find out that we've got scripture that confirms this. We went to Luke chapter 12. Again, some things you're only going to find in Luke. And this is one of them. We see right here in Luke chapter 12, verse 30, starting in verse 35, it says he's talking again to his faithful little flock. OK, this same little group, this little flock that he's going to choose from among the pre-trib remnant bride to stay. Some people call them the Elijah company. And here's what he tells them. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding that when he that when he comes and knocks they may open unto him immediately sound familiar see that when he comes and knocks they may open unto him immediately blessed are those servants whom the lord when he shall find watching verily i say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to eat and will come forth and serve them this is the first watch and they are chosen from the bride from a, among the gentile bride to remain and serve the lord during the time of seals at the very least and we see that they're being told ahead of time that he's about to take the the bride that he's about to go to a wedding which is a seven day wedding and he says when he comes back after seven days, which you're going to see, I'm going to prove it to you, is sometime on the eighth day. And what does he say? Those who, when he knocks, they will open. Um, he will come and sit with them and serve them and eat with them. You see, it's exactly what we were reading of what happens at this tail end of the Laodicean age of what we call the is. So there's the was, which was creation to Christ. There's the is, which is Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. You see, this isn't the pre-trib yet. This is when he's telling them just before the pre-trib to be ready to open when he returns from the wedding when he knocks. Okay? So this is moments before or just shortly before the pre-trib happens. So you can see that this group is a group being prepared and they will be informed before, right before the pre-trib happens. Okay? Now, where else do we see this? When we go into Luke chapter 14, we see that there is a wedding and a banquet meal. Now, when you go into Mark, there is no wedding and there is no banquet. When you go into Matthew's gospel, there is a wedding, but there's no banquet meal. It's just the wedding feast, but no banquet meal. This only happens in Luke. And the reason is, we know this very well as well. Here is the pre-trib group now having been taken to the wedding in the story that we read about the wedding feast in Luke chapter 14. It says, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. Meaning, you know, again, we've talked on this many times. Nobody in this ministry should ever be caught having been taken to the third heaven in the pre-trib and found going to the higher room. We will all sit in the lower room and... If somebody comes to get us to bid us to go higher, then we would go higher to where they would have a sit. Okay. It says, but when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room that when he that bade thee, uh, when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher and thou shall give worship in the presence and thou shall have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This is a prophetic picture built into the is of the story that Jesus was telling them in the parable that he was telling them. And we see this all throughout scripture. It is prophetic. It's a picture of the pre-trib bride. But then what happens? Then when you go look at the scriptures, this portion here, starting in verse 12, 
talks about a banquet meal after the wedding feast. And it says, Then he, then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and recompense thee, and recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lamed, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And this is what you're going to notice all throughout. You saw that he informed a group, then the pre-trib happens, and then he returns from the wedding to that group that he told to be ready when he returns. Okay? So this is the beginning. It starts with letting that group know. Then, bang, the 50 days begin and the pre-trib bride is gone. And now, while there's a wedding taking place in heaven, there will be a full seven days on earth that will pass. <coughs> Excuse me. And while that is taking place in heaven, this remnant group bride will be waiting for the Lord's return, ready to open the door to receive him, and they will be invited to wherever the Lord ends up taking them to have this banquet meal where he will sit with them and serve them and have this meal with them. And then he will open up their understanding and a bunch of things that you're going to see as we get into this that will then take place. When we go to Luke 21, here's where we see this. Watch this. In Luke 21, we read in verse 36. A lot of people know this one very well. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy okay the word accounted worthy is used four times in scripture but only twice is it accounted worthy whereas the other two are counted worthy and their context is something else it is the accounted worthy that is this portion of the pre-trib group it says that they may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass okay and to stand before the son of man well what are they going to escape they're going to escape everything being discussed in luke's discourse but you're going to see within the rest of luke's discourse what's taking place and what that period of time is but what do we see about the accounted worthy the accounted worthy are those who are going pre-trib who will escape absolutely everything but remember, there's a group when they go who is now waiting for the seven days to end. That when the Lord returns on the eighth day, he will knock and they'll open to him. And then a bunch of things will take place. We see this <clears throat> excuse me, in chapter 20. And again, when you understand there's a reason why Luke, Mark, and Matthew's Gospels in the same stories spoken of different, there is always a reason. And we see this here. In the story of the woman that had seven husbands, it says in Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 33, therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering and said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be, there's the second time it's used, accounted worthy to obtain that world. Do you know that this is only found in Luke? Yet this story is also in Mark and in Matthew, but it's spoken of differently because there are three different groups of people being addressed. The accounted worthy are the pre-trib. What world are they going to? Well, they're going to the world that we spoke about here in 2 Corinthians 12. Where are they going? Those who are in Christ going first above the 14 years, which is right at the beginning of the 50 days, they're being like rapture, that's like a rapture, and they're being taken where? To the third heaven. Okay? That's where this group is being taken in the pre-trib. The accounted worthy, those who will obtain that world, and listen to this. Now you see a comma and the word and, which means it's separate in its grouping, but they're together. Like they're like every one of the remnant workers 
are part of the pre-trib group. They are, they are in Christ, spirit-filled. But they're a separate portion. And what do we see? Here they are divided again. Okay? Not divided against each other, but they're separated because there's a conversation for them being uh, taken place as well. You've got the accounted worthy that are going to the third heaven, comma, and the resurrection of the dead. Because theirs, they're going to be putting their necks on the line during the tribulation. And for that work for the Lord, they're going to take part in the first resurrection at the end of tribulation. They will be the first resurrection and they will be the priests and kings who will rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. You notice the accounted worthy, those going pre-trib, those going to the pre-trib wedding and those who will take part in the resurrection of the dead. Well, what did we see here in Luke chapter 14? Those going to the pre-trib wedding and then those who are remaining and calling others to this meal and their reward will be the resurrection of the just. Same thing. It's pretty wild. So remember what I said. We're in, in everything that I've talked about so far is moments before the above starts and then <clears throat> the above, the 50 days now beginning. And this 50 days, <clears throat> excuse me, begins with the pre-trib and then the events of seven days. Remember, the events of seven days, the wedding <clears throat> is going to be one week long. This is something we've shared and we can show in the story of Jacob. We're going to show it in Genesis. We can show it in the Gospel of John. It's absolutely everywhere. We see it right here in the story of Jacob with Leah and Rachel. He worked seven years. Okay? Remember I said everything is in threes. You find out that the end of days, and it's all hidden throughout Scripture. Like There's clear places, but there's, uh, what is it, truth in Christ, I think it is. Um, uh, Brandon? Braid? I can't remember his name. But he does a great job in showing all of the sevens in Scripture, in the 777. That is the revelation of the end of days. There's the first seven, what we call easy years, and as they come to an end, there's the 50 days that come before the next set of seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. Remember, I said 14 years. You're going to see this even in the story of Noah. So what we're seeing here is Jacob worked seven, seven years and they flew by like days because he was so excited to get his bride. And then who does he get? He gets the older before the younger. Okay, so he gets Leah before he gets Rachel, the one he really wanted. Leah is the older, just like those who are in Christ spirit filled are those who are the older. They're the more mature. They're the ones in Christ diligently seeking and searching them. There's a lot more meaning there as well. And what do we find out? We find out that when he fulfills those seven years, he then gets his bride. And what does he have to do? Fulfill her week. So he has the wedding feast, which is one week long. Okay? It is one week long. And you're going to see this in typologies everywhere. What else? Where else do we find it? Well, look what happens here. <coughs> in Luke chapter 17. Again, a story only found in Luke. The disciples and everybody are asking them about the, the coming of the kingdom of God, the end of days. And he first tells them that it's going to be as lightning from one part of heaven unto the other, like lightning that shines from one part unto the other. So shall the Son of Man be in his day. Well, if you go to the discourses, you're going to find this only in Matthew's discourse because it's a prophetic picture of the Lord's return in that final year of tribulation. But then look what he says. But first, meaning before all of this, and I can get to here, there's other things that have to take place. And he says, but first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. When you understand in prophecy, this generation is always speaking prophetically to the final generation. And it's not difficult to understand here because they're asking him, about the end of days when the kingdom of God would come. 
So what does he say? But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So there's a period of time that comes at the beginning called but first where he's going to be rejected of this generation, meaning the world won't accept him when he comes as the son of man, which he's going to do what? When? When he returns from the wedding on the eighth day. And the world is not ready for him. They've all been told that the Antichrist is coming first. So they're expecting the Antichrist, those who remain, right? Those in the world and, and the Christians that weren't ready, the sleeping church and, and all the Muslims, they're going to say it's the Dajjal, the Antichrist. You see, because the world doesn't know that the Son of Man is coming for 40 days as he said he would. Because they never understood the differences in the Gospels. And how, how do you know that this is talking about 40 days in the but first? Because he also says that it would be his 40 day, his days would be as the days of Noah until they can't got in the ark and the flood came. So he's talking about the 40 days of the flood. And this days of Noah has nothing to do with the one that you read about in Matthew. You see, he's telling us right here, it's connected to the but first, this portion in the beginning when it all starts. There's the seven day wedding. And then he's coming back on the eighth day. And when he comes back on the eighth day, it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah, referring to the 40 days of the Son of Man being here. Okay? And watch how it plays out. If we go to Genesis chapter 7, we see the story in starting in verse 4. It says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And then what does it say? And it came to pass in verse 10, and it came to pass after seven days. How long is the wedding? Seven days. You have this picture of the seven days. But when does he come? When do the 40 days of Noah begin? After the seven days. You have the wedding for seven days. You have the Son of Man saying he's going to be coming as it was in the days of Noah, relating to the 40 days of the flood. And that would be on the eighth day that the 40 days begin because it would be after he comes back from the wedding. Well, remember what it just said in Luke 17, verse 25. He said, but first. So there, there's this but first that starts before everything else begins. Or, or I should say this but first, which is in the portion of the above before the 14 years begin. And look at what we find in Luke's discourse. In Luke's discourse, it is very different than Mark's and Matthew's. And if we start in verse 10, listen to what it says. Then said he unto them. Okay? Like he, he's talking to them, but it's not for them. He, it's like he's addressing it. It's This is going to be for the other group. Because he then says, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs sh uh, shall there be from heaven. Now listen to what it says, verse 12. But before all these. You see that? Same wording. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Over here, he says, before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Before the great sword is given and they all start killing each other, it says, but before all these. This is the beginning of the 40 days. But remember what it said about the pre-trib group? They would escape everything. All these things that shall come to pass, meaning everything that you're reading about throughout Luke's discourse, these guys, the pre-trib group is going to escape. But then he's coming for 40 days. And when he comes for 40 days, we're seeing events <clears throat> of things that are going to happen to a group of people, which is that remnant group when he returns for the 40 days, 
and has this meal with them. And then they're with him and following and doing whatever he's going to have them do as they follow him for the 40 days. And it says, uh, but before all these, so before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So what do we see? There's going to be people being brought into prison. And then it goes on to say, you'll be betrayed by both parents, brethren, kinfolk, and friends. And some of you, they're going to cause to be put to death. So you're going to see some being put into prisons. Some of you, it says that will, they will cause to be put to death. So this is stuff that's going to start taking place in the 40 days, in the time that's connected to when he comes to begin his 40 days. And we'll get into that more <clears throat> because look what happens next. If we go to Revelation chapter 2, remember what I said. Once the pre-trib group is taken, the, the seven churches of the end of days will play out again over the above portion of 50 days and the 14 years. So what we're going to start here is we're not going to go to uh, uh, Ephesus yet. We're going to start with Smyrna. And what does he say? He says in verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison. Do you know that Luke's discourse <coughs> excuse me, is the only one that talks about being cast into prison? Why? Because this Smyrna group is that remnant group that remained and then the Lord has that banquet meal when he came and not. Okay? That's why you're seeing the exact same connection of words from Luke's discourse in the portion called above or but before all these things. So it says, and will cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days, but uh, uh, be thou faithful unto death. So you've got this death also taking place and some being put into prison. Again, the exact same conversation that's taking part, taking place in Luke's discourse once the 40 days begin. And what does he tell them as their reward? Not only will they get a crown of life, but it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. This is what I was talking about earlier. Remember, in both cases, we see that there are going to be those who are recompensed at the resurrection of the just. We saw here the pre-trib, those who are counted worthy to go pre-trib to the third heaven, and those who will take part in the resurrection of the dead. Those who are taking part in the resurrection of the dead are the ones who are putting their necks on the line, who are with the Lord for 40 days, once he has come after the wedding, and they are putting their necks on the line, and their reward will be the crown of life, and then they will have, they will not be hurt by the second death. And when you go to Revelation chapter 20, you see that it's those who put their necks on the line, never having taken the mark and everything else, they're going to be resurrected to rule and reign with them for a thousand years, and it says that they will not be hurt by the second death, and everybody else won't be resurrected till after the millennial reign. This is that group serving the Lord, that group that was chosen to be left behind by the Lord to serve him as that remnant bride, as we call them. We see here. Now, what does that mean in relation to, to Smyrna? Well, that means that Smyrna, in the prophetic of the is to come, begins when the Son of Man comes to start his 40 days, which in the above portion is after the seven-day wedding on the eighth day. So what is the portion of Ephesus? Well, what we come to find out with Ephesus is it talks about uh, they have tried those who were not apostles <coughs> and proven them to be wrong, but who's the one? who are the ones approving them? It's going to be the modern-day apostles. So not only is there a remnant group that is waiting for the Lord to return from the wedding, the Lord will have empowered a, a modern-day 
group of apostles just before, uh, uh, just after he has taken the pre-trib bride. Okay, just when the pre-trib bride is taken, it says he's going to come back on the same day at evening. And he's going to anoint these modern day apostles. How long is this period? Well, lo and behold, this anointing happens right after the pre-trib. He's going to return and anoint this group, whoever these modern day apostles will be, at the beginning of the 50 days, right after he's taken the pre-trib, he's going to return and anoint them. And then he's off and he's going to remain for the seven-day wedding. And when he returns on the eighth day, it's the 40 days and the time of Smyrna and Luke's discourse beginning. Well, these guys are already going to be out, already having been anointed with the Holy Ghost. They're going to be off already doing their own thing. This starts the 50 days right after the pre-trip. We see this in the same picture of John chapter 20. In the resurrection story from John, we see where the Lord, you have this typology of Mary Magdalene, a typology of the bride, okay, or this remnant group. And then it says, the same day at evening. So after the pre-trib bride is taken, he it says he, in the prophetic, when you understand it, it's talking about him coming, returning on the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. We know he's with the apostles. And what does he do? In verse 22, it says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and now what's their work? Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. These guys have the power of the Holy Ghost and have the ability to forgive or to retain sin for those who they'll be visiting and talking to and sharing with, especially during even that seven days. Now, how do we know? What are you talking about seven days? Well, we know Thomas wasn't there, right? And he's complaining, you know, how come I wasn't there in the story of what took place in the is? But then look what happens. And after eight days again, well, remember, what is after seven days? It's saying eight days again. <coughs> Excuse me. He's returning on the eighth day. And when he returns on the eighth day, which is after the seven day wedding, he sees Thomas there. Uh, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, peace unto you. You see that again after seven days on the eighth day. This is when he began his 40 days. So we see it in the story of Leah with the wedding. We see it in the story of him saying that he would be uh, uh, as it, uh, uh, but first like Noah. And it talked about the 40 days. And what came before the 40 days is seven days. And after seven days is on the eighth day. So we're seeing all of these connections. There's a wedding. There's a group being prepared, waiting for his return on the eighth day. Wow. He has taken the pre-trib. He is also anointing a group of apostles who will go about doing that work during that time, during the wedding time. And then when he returns on the eighth day, He'll kind of like get a, an update, if you will, from the apostles before he then goes and meets with the disciples that were right waiting for him to return after the wedding on the eighth day. <clears throat> now watch what else happens. While these things are taking place in heaven, while the wedding is taking place, we have a group of people who were told ahead of time to wait for him to return from the wedding. This group we know is Smyrna, and they're going to serve him, put their necks on the line, some of them being put to prison and some to death. Their reward will be the resurrection to rule and reign with them during the thousand years, on which the second death has no effect on them. So you've got this group, which is the Smyrna group, this pre-told group, then what happens? Bang. The pre-trib happens. Then he returns 
on the same day at evening as the pre-trib has taken place. And he anoints whoever these modern day apostles will be. They will have the power and authority, spirit filled to go out and do the work that they need to do. And theirs will begin also on day one of the 50 days beginning, right? Because it says he came back on the same day at evening when he anointed them. Now, <clears throat> while the wedding is in heaven, while one group is waiting for him to return from the wedding, and while one group has already been anointed to go out and do work, what is happening on the earth during that one week wedding? Well, this is something we have known for years. It's in, it's in many places talked about throughout scripture, which connected to Nebuchadnezzar and when they came on the ninth of Av and destroyed Israel. They ended up putting in a new leader, right? Temporarily with Gedalia. And then, what is it? Like 50 days later, after 50 days, then Gedalia is killed. And we're going to talk about that. It's the story. It is a prophetic typology in that story that reveals what we call the two attacks that begin the end of days. Now, you, I, you could say begin the end of days, but really the pre-trib will begin everything because tens of millions of people will have literally vanished. Okay, But once they vanish and the anointing has taken place over these apostles and they're out doing their thing, and while that other group is waiting for them to return from the wedding, what's taking place on earth? Again, we've known this for years, and when we finally came across Isaiah 9 about two or three years ago, it was a game changer because it gave us so much more clarity and proved what we had been teaching. <clears throat> and here it is. In Isaiah 9, starting in verse 1, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as it was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali. This is something we've been teaching on for years. That in Israel, when the pre-trib bride is taken, within, I would say within a day, maybe hours, but within a day, Israel is going to be really attacked. It's called the lightly afflicted, or the light affliction. But it's going to be a very big attack, not completely destroyed you know wiped off the map but definitely a substantial tens of thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of people dead and this prophetic typology of zebulun and naphtali in the end of days is the attack that is going to take place on haifa and tel aviv and this attack is going to come by iran whether israel attacks iran first in a much bigger way that then Iran will retaliate, or whether Iran does it first, I don't know. But I do know that it will be Iran that will attack Zebulun and Naphtali, or Haifa and Tel Aviv, in the end of days. And it is going to be a light affliction, but a devastating affliction. And this is going to bring about a short-lived Middle Eastern war. What's going to be taking place during the seven-day wedding? The attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv and a Middle East war that will break out. But it will only last about those seven days because they're going to want to stop it. There's already chaos in the earth. Millions have vanished. There's going to be chaos. And they're going to want to stop it. They're going to want to stave off World War III. Now, maybe the puppet masters behind everything want it to happen, but the many leaders will still want to prevent full-out war from happening. It will not last long. Because remember, who comes after this light affliction? Well, the Son of Man is coming. The Son of Man is coming back on the eighth day. And look at what it says next. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Who is it? Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Isn't that fascinating? 
You know what's fascinating about it? Remember I've been saying he's coming for 40 days? I've been showing you and proving scripturally he's coming for 40 days. And what does it tell us about? The time of his birth. What was the connection to Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2? 40 days. Pretty wild how that happens, right? Well, if you know your scriptures well, you'll know that it says Jesus fulfilled this in the is. So this was prophetic in the was. Jesus fulfilled it in the is in Matthew chapter 4. Did he fulfill it at his birthday? I mean, it seems to say, unto us a child is born and a son is given. It sounds like it's at his birthday, but we know it didn't actually happen at his birthday because it says John was now cast into prison. But Jesus fulfilled this in Matthew chapter 4. Remember what I said? What was shall be, what is shall be. Everything is in threes. This is the prophetic picture of the light affliction, the Middle East war that will take place from that, that will last about a week, to then the Son of Man coming, shining his light in the darkness in a connection that relates to 40 days. When he's coming to shine his light <clears throat> In the darkness before what happens ah before a more grievous affliction comes we'll get there so now look what happens we come to Luke chapter 21 and we say okay now there's a Middle Eastern war that takes that takes place that will take place over about one week but is there anything else that will be taking place on the earth. Yikes. There is. You got to remember guys. This is now the beginning of the end of days. You see that's why I say. When people try to tell you. That the end of days have literally already started. That the tribulation has already started. They don't know what they're talking about. It is not going to be a joke. It's going to be the real deal. God isn't playing around when his judgment starts. And <clears throat> we see here. Again, where are we? We're in Luke's gospel. Okay, we're in Luke's discourse. So we're all in that above portion still. And what do we see? In verse 25, these are the events. These are the events from Luke 21, 25 to 28. Whereas verse 28 is, or sorry, verse 27 <clears throat> is the Son of Man coming to begin his 40 days. It says, starting in verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them, <coughs> excuse me, for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. <laughs> what? This is going to be intense. Never mind tens of millions of people have vanished. Never mind a Middle Eastern war breaks out with an attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv. Now, within that week, probably in the latter portion, you're going to see this probably in the midst of it, but in the latter portion, you're going to see this thing that has men's hearts failing them because of what these things that are coming upon the earth. The question is, what is all of this coming upon the earth that's preceding the Son of Man coming? Because then what does it say? Then shall they see. So when we begin to see these things, then shall we see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Is the whole world going to know that this is the Son of Man coming? I don't think so. Uh, they don't. Most of the world doesn't even believe in the Lord. They would have no clue what they're seeing anyways. I believe what you're seeing here is that remnant group is being forewarned that when they see these things coming upon the earth in that week, then to look up because they will know that the Son of Man is just about there. So what are these things coming upon the earth which again you find only this story in luke and in luke's discourse well let's go have a look in luke chapter 22 
we see this awesome story that in when when he goes up to the mountain to pray, right? He goes up to the Mount of Olives to pray with his disciples. And then again, you're reading a story that's different in Luke, a little bit different in Mark, and a little bit different in Matthew. And what we see in Luke, only used in Luke, is right here in verse 41. In Luke chapter 22, verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeling down <clears throat> and prayed. Now, we've done a lot of teachings about this over the years. He's saying that he's a stone's throw away from them. When you understand the prophetic picture here, he's talking to his disciples and he's letting this group of remnant disciples in the prophetic typology know that he is a stone's throw away from returning to them. Okay? Remember they're gone for, he's gone for one week to the wedding? They're waiting for his return? We know that it'll be on the eighth day, but he's letting them know that he's going to be a stone's throw away. Well, what does that stone's throw relate to, do you think? These things that are coming upon the earth, that when they see these things coming upon the earth, they will understand that he was what? A stone's throw away, and they'll see him coming in a cloud, in, in a cloud right? With power and great glory. They're the ones that are expecting him to come on the eighth day. Well, it goes even further than that. Again, this is only found in Luke's gospel. When you come to John, John's gospel in John chapter 8, look at what we see. We see <clears throat> right off the bat in verse 1 and 2, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Well, what you find out is at the end of Luke's discourse, with the watch and pray for all those going pre-trib to be accounted worthy to escape everything, in verse 37 and 38, it ends with black letter words, saying, and in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called Mount of Olives, and all the people came early in the morning to the temple for to hear him. Isn't that wild? That's really wild. You're getting the exact same wording that starts John chapter 8 as you do with this conversation of the pre-trib and all those accounted worthy to go and stand before the Lord. And what comes next is a story of a woman taken in adultery. And if you know this, if you've studied this, a woman taken in adultery, or I should say the word adultery is also often referenced as a Gentile. And we see this with the name of Ruth. Right? Why have you taken why have you taken interest in me, a stranger, <clears throat> as Ruth says to her kinsman redeemer? And the word stranger is also described as an adulterer. You see? It's a picture of the bride of Christ. Okay? Or you can even say maybe it's a picture because the pre trib bride is gone, that it's a picture of the remnant. Like I said, like like uh, uh Mary Magdalene. <laughs> in John chapter 20. So you're seeing again this bride or this remnant bride portion. And look at what it says in verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Verse 6. This they said, tempting him that they might have uh, uh, that they might have to accuse him but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. We all know that story, right? Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. You seeing how that fits? Are you seeing the connection? A remnant portion of the bride in he says to his disciples that he's coming back for, I'm a stone's throw away. In Luke chapter 21, there's these things coming from above that has many people in the world panicking, people dying of a heart attack. And he tells them that when you see this coming, you know to look up because I'm coming in a cloud. They're the only group aware to look at him, look for him coming in a cloud. And he told them that he would be a stone's throw away. And so who's the only one that can cast the stone, the one who is without sin among them. Who's the only one among them without sin? Jesus, which means Jesus is the one casting the stone 
or he's with that stone or he's coming or that stone's coming and and he, he's connected with it because he said he was a stone's throw away and here he is a stone's throw that's coming from the one who is without sin and then what does he do he stoops back down on the ground it says and they which heard it being convicted of their own conscience they all started leaving the eldest to the youngest <coughs> excuse me and jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst there he is now standing with that remnant bride and when jesus lifted himself lifted up himself and saw none but, but the woman he said unto her woman where are thou accusers hath no man condemned thee she said no man <clears throat> no man lord and jesus said unto her neither do i condemn thee go and sin no more so if this is a picture now of the son of man coming at the stone's throw and they were watching for him understanding that the stone's throw was coming and that they would look up and see that he was coming what do we know when he comes he's coming as well we know he's coming after that attack right we know he's coming after the seven day wedding but on earth was the light affliction in Haifa and Tel Aviv and what did it say that at that point when he comes as the son of man connected to 40 days he would come to shine his light in the darkness well what does it say next in John chapter 8 verse 12 then spake Jesus again unto them saying I am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life wow you see how it all connects this is him coming this is him here on the eighth day this is him saying he's going to be the one casting the stone that they're to watch for because he told them he was a stone's throw away so what are you going to see happening <clears throat> excuse me during the the seven day wedding there's going to be a an attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv um, Middle Eastern war breakout and while that happens there's going to be distresses of things happening on the earth with signs in the sun moon and stars and things falling from above like the stone throw maybe a meteor and it breaking up <clears throat> probably still a very big chunk and some smaller ones but still really big ones men's hearts failing them looking after these things and then here comes <clears throat> the son of man in a cloud just as he said is connected to when he returns on the eighth day which is when he comes as the light shining in the darkness as we saw from isaiah 9. incredible well what else is there <clears throat> we see and a lot of people have had trouble with this over the years but i'm always happy to clarify it a lot of people say well um because I, I explain that the white horse rider is the son of man coming and if you wanted the details of it just go to the video list on youtube and you will see a picture of a of the head of a white horse really nice picture and watch that teaching the son of man is the white horse rider and a lot of people have said how could it be that jesus is the white horse rider when he's the one opening the seals the answer is because he opens one of the seals first one of the seals and he comes as the white horse rider how do we know this well you're going to understand this now because there's a p time when peace is taken and then they're given the great sword to start killing one another okay if you remember Luke chapter 21 when Jesus is coming <clears throat> what's he going to be doing he's going to be warning here we are back in Luke chapter 21 and what is Jesus going to do for 40 days w what's what's his work involve okay now he's here now he's the light of the world and all who come to him won't be in darkness and what is he doing even though they're all rejecting him except for those that know who he is and some will who, who will accept who he is well in Luke 21 verse 20 it says and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies 
See, not Haifa and Tel Aviv, not two nations, any, not two cities anymore, but Jerusalem. But when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Um, then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Everything is about to start. When you see Jerusalem compassed about with armies, it's all about to start once Jerusalem falls. Remember, I said the 14 years begins at the end of the 50? Well, that's what he's explaining is coming. It says, um, For these be the days of vengeance, all things are written might be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days. Uh, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles will not be fulfilled until the end of seals at the mid-trib great multitude rapture. So he's warning. Who else do we know was warning for 40 days? And do we see Jesus comparing himself to him? Well, yes, we do. Anybody who has studied this knows the difference in Luke, Mark, and Matthew when it comes to the story of Jonah. It's very confusing for many. We have proven what it is. We can explain it all. And the one in Luke, we see right here, starting in verse 29, they seek a sign, there shall no sign be given, but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to, remember this, this generation, the prophetic final generation. He's going to be as Jonah was. He hasn't fulfilled it. What was Jonah? He was a 40-day sign warning Nineveh. And what does Jesus say he'll be? The Son of Man says he's going to be as Jonah was to the final generation. <clears throat> well, lo and behold, that's exactly what we just got in Luke's discourse that, again, is only found in Luke's discourse and nowhere else. Again, another piece of scripture showing that he himself said he would be as Jonah was a warning for 40 days. We also found scripture that said he was going to be as Noah was for 40 days. Then we found scripture when he comes as light, it would be like at his birth connected to 40 days. Incredible how that works, right? Well, we see another thing that again was only found in Luke's discourse, in Luke's gospel. And it's the story of the triumphal entry, which is, we've got teachings on this, it is a prophetic picture of the Son of Man coming to begin his 40 days. And look at what we see in Luke 19, starting in verse 41, 41 through 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round about and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Did you hear all of that? Sound familiar? What did he warn them about? They're going to be compassed about with armies and destroyed and woe to them that are with children. Distress, they're going to take you into captivity, destroy you with the sword. He's warning them, and it is a prophetic picture, not only to things in the past, but of the is to come. He is weeping over Jerusalem having and warning them because they knew not, they understood not the time of their visitation because they have erred. And they're about to be compassed about, he's warning, which means the compassing about doesn't happen during his 40 days, but comes after his 40 days. 
So they're what? Peace is going to be taken away from them. The peace is going to be taken away. Well, look what happens when the 40 days of the Son of Man are over. We have a time shortly after when the red horse rider, when the when the uh, second seal is opened, and with the red horse what rider, we see it says, to him that sat there on, to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. This is the beginning of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And how does it start? Once peace is removed, then the sword is given that they can all start killing each other. But where does it begin? Jesus already told them. It will begin with the compassing about of Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed, and they will be taken captive, and they will fall by the edge of the sword, and Jerusalem will be trodden down until the time of the Gentiles is over, which is the end of seals. It's absolutely incredible. Well, let's go back into Luke 17. In Luke 17, as we said, we have this but first rejected as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in, in the days of the Son of Man. We know it's connected to his 40 days again. And when we come to Luke chapter 24, remember that group? Remember, he's, he's going to what? Suffer many things, right? He's going to suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So while he's here for the 40 days like his birth, while he's here <clears throat> during the 40 days of chaos, because the pre-trib had happened, and then he's here for the 40 days warning, as he said he would as Jonah, we know he's going to be rejected. And what do we see in Luke chapter 24? Again, what is Luke chapter 24? It follows John chapter 20. So it's the eighth day, and now the beginning of his 40 days after he first met with the apostles. Now these two on the road to Emmaus are the prophetic picture of that remnant bride portion who were waiting for him to return on the eighth day to have that banquet meal with them. Remember, he said he would sit down and serve them and eat with them. And he would only do that to that first group. Okay? The second and the third group that you see in Luke chapter 12 is later groups, and they're not talked about the same way. Only the first one does he sit with and have a meal and serve them, which is exactly what was from Luke chapter 12 that he said, and Luke chapter 14 that happens after the seven-day wedding when he has this banquet meal with them. And so here we are in the prophetic understanding in Luke 24 in the picture of the 40 days when the Son of Man has now come. And what does he tell the two on the road to Emmaus, which is the prophetic picture of the remnant workers? Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Then they're walking, right? And they constrain him. They want him to abide with them. And what does he say? Or what does it say in verse 30? And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave to them only luke's discourse i mean only luke's uh gospel does this say not in mark not in matthew only in luke's does he sit down to eat with them break bread and serve them and eat with them exactly like he said in luke chapter 12 connected to that prophetic understanding of that remnant group who is here with them having waited for him when he returns from the wedding and what does he do he ends up opening their understanding. Okay, down in 44, this is all the beginning of the 40 days. It says, <clears throat> and he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was yet with you, that all these things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. It says, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You do not read this in Mark, nor do you read it in Matthew. And it's a prophetic reason for all of these differences within the Gospels. And then what happens? They're, they're to go out and preach repentance, remission of sins, right, among all nations. And what does it say? Beginning at Jerusalem. 
beginning at Jerusalem. You don't read this in Mark. You don't read this in Matthew, which means this group is going to be when his 40 days are over, <clears throat> they're going to be waiting in Jerusalem for an anointing from the Holy Ghost before going out from Jerusalem before what? Before the attack. Before the attack. You see, the Lord is warning for 40 days. When the 40 days are over and the Lord is gone, this the armies are coming to surround. And then Jerusalem will be destroyed after the 50th day on day one of the 14 years. We can even show this. <clears throat> we know from Luke chapter 24, we follow into Luke 21, and we see that the Lord had completed his 40 days. He tells them not many days hence. Well, if it's been seven and 40, there's three days left in the 50 days. We get to Luke chapter two, we find out it's Pentecost, and it's this remnant group of disciples in the same typology as it was from the resurrection who will receive this Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost on the 50th day. Remember what Revelation 6 told us. Revelation 6, peace hasn't yet been taken from the earth. Okay? Peace hasn't yet been taken from the earth. And so here we are, this group, now the Son of Man is gone. They're now in Jerusalem. They saw the Lord leave now, and this remnant bride group is in Jerusalem waiting for this anointing of the Holy Ghost. When they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost, they're accused of being drunk on or being, these men are full of new wine, which means they're being accused of being drunk on wine because the connection to the Holy Ghost at true Pentecost is when the wine is ready. And then what does it say? Verse 15, for these are not drunken as you suppose them, uh, as you supposed, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. So it's because of this anointing, they appear to those there as if they're drunk, but they're not drunk. But there's a reason why we're told new wine and being drunk. It's not only because they're filled with the spirit, with this incredible power and having already received the understanding from the Lord, but it's telling us the timing in relation to Pentecost. OK, now watch what happens. In Revelation chapter six, the son of man, the white horse rider was here for 40 days. When the 40 days were over, he left and there were three more days on the 50th day. The remnant group will be anointed by the Holy Ghost in what we call Acts 2.0. And the red horse rider is going to be the one to take peace from the earth. Who represents peace? The Holy Ghost. Okay? Meaning, it doesn't mean that the red horse rider is the one going to grab the Holy Ghost and leave. No, there will be no more comfort, no more space, no more place for the Holy Ghost here outside of in that group of people because remember what's happened everybody that was taken pre-trib were the ones that were restraining everything on the earth because they were the ones filled with the holy ghost now the holy ghost is going to kind of like restart as it did the church age but it's the final push for the seven years of seals and it's going to be when the holy ghost now leaves when the 50 days are over, anoints that group in Jerusalem and they will go out from Jerusalem. And when they go out and the, the, the Holy Ghost is left outside of being within that group of people, it says, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. You see that the Holy Ghost goes first and then them killing each other and a great sword being given. That's, again, exactly these things we've been looking at and what it says in Luke 21. He's warning them about being compassed about. When the 40 days are over and there's three days left, Jerusalem is going to start to get compassed about. And after the third day, which that third day is the 50th day, after that third day, on the first day of the 14 years, the great sword is given, the, the Holy Ghost is gone, 
the great sword is given and Jerusalem is the first to be attacked and destroyed. Remember falling by the edge of the sword? Now the great sword is given at the end of those 50 days. That's exactly what we're seeing. And we can prove this out scripturally. Because remember, in the story of Genesis, it was the 40 days of the Son of Man. When his 40 days were over, look what happens. The raven is sent out. Who is the raven? Let me show you on Esort. Here's the raven, the Hebrew word 6158, from its dusky hue, and it comes from the root word 6150, which means Arab. Arab. The Antichrist spirit is the Ishmael, is the Arab spirit Antichrist that's coming. He will be an Arab. He will be Muslim. You see, the covering with a texture, a dusky glow. There, there's a dusky cover to their skin. It is the Arabs. That's what's coming. And this raven who represents an Arab is the one who is compassing about, as Jesus had warned about, but he doesn't attack until the anointing of the, Holy, of the dove, of the Holy Ghost, on the 50th day. And then what happens? Just like Revelation 6 said, the dove, the peace is removed, and then the sword is given. So let's see if we can track this. Genesis chapter 8, verse 6, the end of the 40 days of the Son of Man. Three days are left. The raven goes out first, and the compassing about takes place by an Arab leader, right? The army's compassing about. It'll be Arab. And then it says, and he also sent forth the dove. And then what happens? The dove is the 50th day that will anoint the remnant workers who will then go out from Jerusalem. And then what do we see? But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot and returned into the ark. The dove will then return to heaven just as it said at the time of the red horse rider before the sword was given, peace is removed from the earth. And remember what it said about Pentecost? With Pentecost, it said that it had to do with wine at the time of the Holy Ghost, which is represented by peace and represented by the dove. Well, look at what the dove means. It comes from the root word 3196. Look at that. Wine, banqueting, the intoxication, right? The dove is connected to the wine. Well, then look what happens next. When the dove is now gone, the 50 days have come to an end. And the beginning of the 14 years of the sword of the red horse rider, which is the destruction that begins at Jerusalem. When we go to the rest of the story in Genesis, the dove is now gone and the 14 years of tribulation begin. You want to see what it says? When the dove is now gone, found no rest for the soul of her foot, gone back to heaven. Now the 14 years begin and look what it said. Genesis chapter 8, verse 10. And he stayed yet seven other, other seven days. In prophecy, days can also be a typology for years. So you've got seven days as seven years. Then the dove goes out and comes back with an olive leaf or an olive branch plucked off. That's the Gentiles, right? The Gentiles that were grafted into the house of Israel, the church. The dove comes back and now the great multitude rapture happens mid-trip. And then what does it say? Verse 12. And then he stayed yet seven other days. Seven more years. The seven years of trumpet judgments. Seven of seals. Seven of trumpets. But look at what happens at the end of the 50 days. Once the Holy Ghost, once the dove is gone, once peace is removed. It says, then the first seven begins, right? And he stayed yet seven other days. Look at what the word in Genesis 8.10 means. It's the word for tribulation. Pain, 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 pain. It's tribulation. It's the whirling. It's the grievous. It's, it's tribulation. The official tribulation of the 14 years now beginning at the red horse rider that starts with nation against nation 
beginning with an attack on Jerusalem. Now, watch where this leads us. Look at with the dove, okay? We now see that peace is taken from the earth. The dove is taken from the earth. We can see that the dove represents the time of wine. It's not only there in uh, in Acts. It's also there for us in the picture when we followed the end of the 40 days of the Son of Man, like he told us in Luke 17. Now the dove leaves, and the definition of the dove is also connected to wine. Well, when we go to Luke chapter 3, we see the same thing. The dove what? The Holy Ghost is clearly the dove. And the dove was connected to the Holy Ghost as wine, and the dove was defined in the Old Testament as wine. Okay? The dove is peace. Well, when the dove is now gone, when peace has been removed, and then the sword is given because the 50 days are over, now it's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Now it says what? Revelation 6 just told us once peace is taken from the earth, it says, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So the sword of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom starts, and it starts with the attack on Jerusalem. Watch what it says. Luke's discourse, what did it tell us? Then said he unto them, nation, against na uh, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But verse 12 told us, but before all these. So this is all of the stuff that takes place after the pre-trib and in the portion called above. When the above 50 days is done and the Holy Ghost is removed, then the sword is given that they can now go nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Well, remember the way Luke said it. Then said he unto them. So he's saying, this is what I'm saying to the rest of those guys, to Mark and Matthew in their groups. What I'm telling you guys is, but before all of these, meaning all of this stuff coming is what's going to take place in the above portion after the pre-trib before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Let me prove it to you. We go to Mark's discourse, which begins the 14 years, which begins at the red horse rider once the Holy Ghost is removed. And look at Mark's discourse. Verse 8, For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Do you see anything about a but first? Any, any conversation about anything like that? Nope. Because Mark's discourse begins at nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, the beginning of the 14 years at the Red Horse Rider, once peace has been removed from the earth. Well, look what happens in the rest of the story of Isaiah 9. It was the light affliction after the pre-trib the, the, the Middle Eastern war that will take place with, a, with an attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv, this Middle Eastern war that will last a week until the Son of Man comes to begin his 40 days, as was at his birth for 40 days, the light shining in the darkness when, they, when we will have seen a, a stone's throw coming to know that he is on his way because he's only a stone's throw away. Then he's here for 40 days. And when the 40 days as Noah, as Jonah, are over, there's three days. These guys receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They go out from Jerusalem. And then the attack by the Ishmael, who was compassing them about, by the Arab, by the raven, who was compassing them about, now attacks Jerusalem and destroys it. Exactly the reason why Jesus as the Son of Man, was warning them. Why was he warning them? Why would they have to flee Jerusalem? Why would they be fleeing? You see, they're not going to be able to sustain this attack because it is God's will that they be removed for their disobedience and that the land can rest. But now watch what happens. There's the light affliction, the one week. Here's the Son of Man coming for his 40 days. When his 40 days are over, like I said, and they're waiting for the anointing of the Holy Ghost while Jerusalem is being surrounded, 
they receive the anointing and they go out from Jerusalem and then look what happens. Bam. Remember what it said? Afterward, a greater or a grievously affliction. What is that one? Verse 12. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Who's coming with the more grievous affliction? With the destruction when the red horse rider is given, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We saw that it was the raven, the Arab. It is going to be Syria and those with Syria who are what Jesus said the armies compassing them about that will happen at the end of his 40 days in the remaining three days. It's going to be the Arab. It's going to be that raven spirit, which is defined as Arab, which is going to be Syria. And I've said a number of times that it's connected to Ishmael because the prophetic story we have all throughout scripture is also, as I said earlier, when when they came on the ninth of Av and destroyed and attacked, then they installed Gedalia. Remember, there's going to be the first attack. It'll last about a week. They'll probably put somebody else new in charge. Maybe Netanyahu. Maybe they'll be dead. Right? I don't know how that plays out. But in the prophetic typology, Gedalia is put in place. And then Ishmael comes. And he doesn't believe the report that Ishmael is coming and is going to kill him. Well, look what happens. I want to show you this incredible connection as I bring this to a close. <clears throat> In Jeremiah chapter 40, when we see this same story, this first attack on the ninth of Av, Gedalia gets put in, and bam, on Tishri 1, after 50 days, they're attacked and destroyed. Okay? So Gedalia doesn't want to trust or believe that Ishmael, the Arab line, is coming to attack and to kill him and the Jews. Well, in Jeremiah chapter 40, verse 12, they're preparing at the time of the gathered wine and summer fruits. Okay? Well, what do we know? This preparing would relate to the 50th day before the attack that comes later that day or that, that following day to begin the 14 years. Well, what was Gedali and his people doing? They gathered wine. They gathered wine. Look at this. Look familiar? They gathered wine. The effervescence, the intoxication. Does it sound familiar? When we go to Genesis, uh, yeah, Genesis chapter 8, when it was the time of the dove, the dove goes out. We know it's the anointing time. And the definition for the dove, watch this. Not only was it pigeon or dove, 3196. It's the same word for the gathered wine that they were about to have a banquet with at the end of 50 days, which is directly connected to what we've been showing is the connection to Pentecost at the end, that final 50th day. And then what happens at the end of that 50th day? We see that Ishmael is there. Everything's being gathered for that day. He's told he's about to be slain and Jerusalem would then be destroyed. He doesn't believe it. And in Jeremiah chapter 41, on Tishri 1, the Feast of Trumpets, Ishmael comes and kills all Jews that are there remaining with Gedalia. Now, does this mean that in the end of days, it's going to play out the same 50 days from uh, that would play out to uh, um, Feast of Trumpets? No. It's a prophetic type. Might it play out the 50 days before Tishri 1 and then the attack on Jerusalem? It may, but it doesn't have to because it's a prophetic typology. What it's showing us, what it's confirming for us, is the exact same thing we've been showing this whole way through, is that there's a 50-day piling of events that take place, of which after the pre-trib, there's an attack one, light affliction, followed by a second attack that will destroy Jerusalem after the 50th day. It's the same story that we have here 
giving us a prophetic confirmation of what was shall be connected to the 40 days connected to the wedding in the pre-trip connected to this remnant group connected to the anointing at the time of wine but it doesn't mean it has to take place at these same specific times but it's the layout of the events that are taking place this is what's coming this 40-day warning of the son of man is the warning of Syria coming and those with Syria that will compass about Jerusalem after the 40 days in the final three days of the 50 to the wine appointed time where the Holy Ghost, the dove before peace is taken is going to anoint that remnant group in what we call Acts 2.0 and then go out from Jerusalem and then Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed and that will begin the 14 years precisely as we saw laid out throughout this entire storyline and clearly shown to us in a big far away overview of the end of days. It's wild, brothers and sisters. And let me end <clears throat> with one final piece. In the midst of all of this, there is going to be a modern-day Cyrus. This modern-day Cyrus, I don't know if he's coming after the first attack that he'll, that he'll make himself known. I don't know if it's coming maybe shortly after the attack that destroys Jerusalem. I believe it would be more so after the attack that destroys Jerusalem. And remember, that attack that destroys Jerusalem is the beginning of nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Okay? But it doesn't mean the whole world instantly starts killing each other all over the place. It starts at Jerusalem. And in this time frame, there is going to be somebody step forward on the scene who will be the modern typology of Cyrus I have a belief in who I think it may be but I don't know it with a certainty and what's going to happen is just as they will think that Messiah who is here as the son of man for 40 days is the Dajjal because all Christians have been taught that Antichrist comes first and all of the Muslims know that a Dajjal character is coming that is why just as Messiah is being rejected, when his 40 days are over and he's gone, what are they going to think? What are the Christians going to think realizing, oh my goodness, the Antichrist is gone so quick? You see, because they will have failed to have understood. The same type of thing is going to happen with whoever this modern day Cyrus is going to be. But how will you know who he is? Because he is going to be given authority he's going to be in a powerful leadership position who is going to have some power and authority over different nations on the earth now many people would say that sounds like the antichrist nope and how you're going to know it is because he is going to proclaim the rebuilding of the temple in jerusalem in that time frame around the beginning probably after the 50 days right somewhere something like that shortly after the 50 days he is going to be the one to make a proclamation to allow israel to go and to rebuild their temple in jerusalem now why am i bringing this up because the world of prophecy in the church has told everybody that the one who decrees the rebuilding of the temple is the one who's going to be the Antichrist. And once the temple is built, he is going to go step in the temple and declare himself to be God. The problem with all of that is they have only understood the gospel through the eyes of Matthew. They have not understood Mark. They have not understood Luke. And they have not understood. They have scrambled everything in relation 
to the true prophetic understanding of the end of days, and they have smashed it all together in one seven-year period. And they believe that it's the Antichrist who is going to declare the rebuilding of the temple. It is not true. It is going to be the modern-day Cyrus who is going to declare the rebuilding of the temple. And there will be a group sent back to start rebuilding. However, during the tribulation of the seven years of seals, only the foundation will be done because at about mid-seals is when the Antichrist really comes on the scene at the end to settle World War III and to make people believe that there's going to be a relief in him who has now come to power. Cyrus and the decree to rebuild the temple and its proclamation to go and to start doing it is not the Antichrist. And the church has been blinded from the truth in the understanding of the revelation. And this teaching today was to prepare people in the understanding through Scripture ahead of time to leave this, to, to download the video. You can download it from our website probably within the next couple of days. Post it on your YouTube channels. Post it to other places and give people a chance to hear this. It's, it's not too, too long. And it is a great detail so that it can be everywhere that when these things begin to come to pass, people, if they're left behind, will remember this, can study it more, can, can remember that they've heard about it. And so when these things come, they will understand what's taking place and won't fall for the deceptions of the misunderstanding of what the church has been teaching for so many centuries. This is the revelation. And I can prove it to you in hours of detail from Genesis to the end of Revelation. So please take this to heart. Spend your time in it. Study it. Discern it. Share it everywhere you can. And at least there will be copies everywhere. There will, people, there will be people that will be left behind that thought they already knew things that, you know, but they were really asleep and caught up in the things of the world. We don't know who they are until that time comes. But imagine how many people this can reach and how many people can then hopefully come to Christ when he comes as the son of man, when they realize why they were left behind and what's about to come next. So with that, brothers and sisters, I appreciate you. I love you. Thank you for suggesting this tonight. God bless you, and we'll talk to you soon. Share it far and wide. Bye for now.